Hello, welcome to Idajo Live. This time we will look at the third symphony of Gustav Mahler. I don't know how long you can listen to music. First of all, you should prepare yourself for a length, for a long period of time. This symphony was written in a in a different, in a generation who actually loved the, the, the great um, uh, dimensions. This was the time of novels, of many volumes. Everything was long and big. The Ring, you know, Wagner wrote an opera or a sequence of operas which last four evenings. And this one is one of the longest symphonies. It will last maybe 80, 90 minutes. So prepare yourself. You know, today we'll be like to listen short. I don't know why everything lasts maybe three or four minutes. I don't know, this is the usual length of a pop song. If, if a pop song is six minutes, it's considered very long. Now, different, an hour and a half. And there is something universal about this symphony. Nature is the main subject. And for Mahler, nature was something very different than what we first think. He actually once complained that people, if you, if you talk about nature, they always want to hear about flowers and lovely birds or something, something um, beautiful. But nature is not always beautiful. A part of nature is actually very um, scary and, and uh, the force of nature is, is uh, stronger than we are. He considered calling this symphony Pan, Pan. That's the name of the Greek god of nature, of, of shepherds and hunters and fields and forests, Pan. I love actually this god. He's, he has, you know, a goat, body and a, a human upper body and he loves to pursue women he's always surrounded by nymphs he runs after them there was one story when he ran after sea rings who who then the other nymphs turned into a, a reed and then um pan didn't know which one and so he, he, in one of the versions, he made a big sigh and then the music came through the reeds. So he created a, a, a sequence of reeds. This is what we call the Pan Pipe, because the god Pan, you know, he was also a musician. And that, that's why he's a special favorite of mine. He had a contest with Apollo, which he lost, of course, because Apollo was a greater musician and a greater god. But Pan was somebody who loved nature, music, and everything which is earthy. So there is something universal. The way Mahler talked about this symphony was that he tried to write everything into this symphony. Like what he received from nature in a, in, a, in, in a very broad sense, it's in the symphony. There was a story of Bruno Walter who looked once at a beautiful mountain together with Mahler and Mahler said, don't look at it, I composed it already. So this, this, this was the, the relationship. Mahler experienced nature and life and everything and composed everything in this universal symphony, the third. Now, it starts. It's a very 
very simple melody. Now, uh, do you know maybe something similar like... Um, what is this? This is the uh, first symphony of Brahms, which is not uh, very different than... the same origin. Do you know this one? Um, Wir hatten gebaut ein städtisches Haus und Rinnowet vertraut. Do you know this? Trotz Actually, Brahms uses it in, a, in an overture on this is a, a German student song. It could be the origin of Brahms and Mahler melodies. But now, anyway, here we have this version. Es war eine alte, tiefe, tiefe Boomglocke. There is an old, heavy, heavy boom. How can I translate this bum clock? Which, which sends up the 12 beats. And then what do you think during the 12 beats at night? Boom. Du Mensch gebacht, bumm, was spricht die tiefe Mitternacht? Bumm, ich schlief, ich schlief, so I was at sleep, bumm, aus tiefem Traum bin ich erwacht, so I woke up in the middle of night, bumm, die Welt ist tief, bumm, und tiefer als der Tag gedacht. These are the 12 beats and the 11 um, lines of a poem in Zarathustra. This is Nietzsche's Zarathustra. Boom! Tief ist ihr Weh. Boom! Lust, tiefer noch als Herzeleid. Now this is a line Mahler must have lo loved, that lust is deeper than the pain of the heart. Boom! Wie spricht vergeh? Boom! Doch alle Lust will Ewigkeit. So all desires want eternity. Boom! Will tiefe, tiefe Ewigkeit. Boom! So there's this deep, deep bell, but there are also small bells like boom, bing, bong, bing, bong, bing, bong, bing, bong, bing, bong. So let's have a children's choir singing these small bells. This is how, how Mahler's mind might have worked. Now, the universe, universe for him, Pan, the god, awakes, the summer marches in with the student song that will last half an hour. Then you have a little flower, beautiful flower music, very simple melody. 
just a little flower music, then the birds will come, a post horn in the distance, who kind of sings, sings like the echo comes back like from a dead colleague of, the, of this man who blows the post horn. Then comes again this, this, this heavy boom, 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 boom. Then we hear the, the, this poem of this boom, 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 that we will hear it. Then bim, bam, bim, bam, bim, bam, bim, bam, the, 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 all the angels. And then finally, like a solution to this, this, this universal symphony, the magnificent last movement. Mahler actually ends with this slow movement. And um, when um, he composed this very simple melody, this divine love. Uh, who has this simplicity? Do you know this maybe? This harmony started the, the beautiful, the slow movement in Beethoven. Nine symphony or or another key this quality of writing beautiful adagios with very simple harmonies. This is one of the piano concertos. Um, but Mahler had it too. And the Mahler somehow develops it differently. Beethoven becomes very spiritual usually and then, then hovers around a few notes. And Mahler develops uh, th this emotional wealth of, 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 of these adagio movements, but there is something simple at the start. This. Nothing happens. In which is not human love, it has nothing erotic in it, it, it just has this flowing divine love which, which makes everybody so happy and, and cry at the same time. It will develop and then finally we are in the same key, you know, we started, you remember, with these two notes and then we will end with this magnificent grand orchestra and then and you will hear the bells again. The bells in the bass, the, they, they will be huge boom glocke, these bells again. I, I always find it's difficult to achieve because it's the vanity of the timpanists sometimes are in the way because 
they, 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 would, they shouldn't beat it like, I don't know, something hard, but they, they have to feel like the, 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 the bells of the universe, which give us this heartbeat of the world. And that, that uh, this, this festive but gentle uh, universal, universe feeling ends this symphony. Prepare yourself for, for something big and something which is about nature and the God Pan and everything in this hour and a half. It's one of my favorite symphonies. It's very, very happy. There is nothing problematic in it. It's, it, it, it makes us listen for this enormous length and everybody loves it. Now let's see if I can answer your questions. I have to let my dog in one second. Come in. Good. And here I can see something. Um, so, to conduct such symphony is also connected with physical effort. How do you prepare yourself for it? Well, I, I, I'm sorry to say, but it's not true. There is no effort. I never ever feel tired because it's such a harmonious piece, even if it's full of um, uh, everything, it's not, not at all tiring. Now the next one, a performance practical question. At the beginning of the symphony, eight horns play a powerful fanfare. I, I, this is it, of course, on the piano, it sounds very soft, you know, but when eight horns play it, it has a little, well, I think it's like a, a choir of students, that sort of sound. So anyway, the question. Eight horns play a powerful fanfare, and Mahler writes for the double instrumentation of winds anyway, where there are many wind players. How does an orchestra organize that? There are never so many musicians in the standard formation, or, well, this is a, an organizational question, of course, it's a huge, um, vast orchestra, and it it uh, it is necessary because Mahler wanted to express everything. He always wanted something very big, and actually even loud. Um, there is a story that once he went to the to the Niagara Falls. And he went down a, a tunnel. I also went down because I wanted to see it. And we go in a tunnel and you have the waterfall right in front of you. And apparently Mahler turned back and said to his friend, finally forte. So finally it's loud. He, he always wanted something huge. And the symphony orchestra is bigger than an average orchestra. One has to appoint uh, additional extra players, but uh, it's always a great joy to, to perform this masterpiece. We made a recording of it, which you can hear if you click here, um, down, uh, um, there's a little lower on your screen, um, you will see two links. One link is a list of, of my recordings with the Budapest Festival Orchestra, and the other one, um, is the performance of the third symphony, which I highly recommend. Thank you for listening. This was Aidajo Live, and I will see you next week with the fourth symphony of Gustav Mahler. Goodbye.